Hello, viewers, and welcome to episode one of Mustang Madness. In this series, I'll be pitting three Mustang kits against each other, produced by Tamiya, Airfix, and Edward. So let's get started. The first kit we'll look at is Tamiya's 1995 molding of the P51D Mustang. Even though the molds of this kit are 25 years old, it's still the benchmark Mustang for many companies when producing their own version. If you've ever built a Tamiya Mustang, you can see why. The fit is amazing, the detail is very fine and crisp, and there's almost no obstacles along the way as you build the kit. The only real drawbacks for this kit are the simple details in the cockpit and the boxed-in wheelbase, which are not accurate for a Mustang. But as stated, this kit has been out for 25 years, so there's lots of resin accessories and updates on the market that are available. All prices that I'll give in this series are in Canadian dollars, and for $30 you can pick up this kit and have money left over for some nice add-ons if you wish. There's really nothing bad that can be said about this kit, and if you're someone that enjoys a simple build that'll go together with zero issues, this is the one for you. On the flip side of that, if you're someone that likes to scratch build and improve a kit, there's lots of room on this kit for you to do that. Recreating a plywood floor for the Mustang is very simple. First, I laid down some Tamiya Deck Tan Beige, and then followed up with some burnt sienna oil paints. Once I was happy with the streaking and the plywood look of the floor, I then covered it up with some Tamiya X22 gloss. Once the gloss coat had time to dry, I then applied two thin layers of Vallejo chipping fluid over top of it and allowed that to dry for an hour. Once the chipping fluid had dried, I then covered it with Tamiya's XF85 Rubber Black. Once the paint had dried, I brought in a stiff, moistened brush and started chipping away the paint. With the chipping complete, it was then time to seal it all in with another flat clear coat. One simple way to upgrade the look of your Tamiya Mustang is to add some battery leads to the back of the cockpit. Here I'm just using some tape that's been sliced very thin to recreate the look of a P-clamp that would hold the cables in place. Once the lead wires were bent to shape, I then secured them with some super glue. Because this radiator is going to be buried deep in the aircraft after the two fuselage halves are together, I decided to paint it now and then dry brush the aluminum to give it a nice weathered look. To me it calls out for the radio frame to be painted black, but some reference photos I found of Mustangs had this as an interior green. Tamiya's kit also comes with a life raft molded into the seat, so I decided to paint that yellow matching some other reference photos on the web. Yellow is a very hard color to work with, and this Vallejo Sunburst Yellow took a few coats to cover fully. This is about as detailed as the Tamiya Mustang's cockpit will get, so I decided to highlight a few of these panels just to see how it would look when the fuselage halves are put together. I wanted to do a very honest review of these three kits, so I decided not to buy any aftermarket items for them. The only things I'm going to add are some seat belts, and everything else is going to be from scratch build material. All the internal paintings being done with Vallejo model color paint. Painting the battery post silver will also add a little more depth to these batteries. One area that the Tamiya Mustang is lacking is the cockpit decals, so I decided to replace those with this spare set I had from an Airfix kit. It's always a good idea to keep all those unused decals around just in case. Microset and Microsol are both used with the decals to reduce any chance of silvering. And after a few hours, the Tamiya cockpit is complete and the two fuselage halves are ready to come together. The cockpit pretty much drops into place and there's no sloppiness here, so there's no guesswork when you're putting this kit together. 
So to summarize the cockpit of the Tamiya Mustang, there's really no issues, so you won't have any surprises as you're going down the road. If you're not happy with the detail of the Tamiya kit, you can pick up an Edward Photo Etch kit as something simple to work with, or you can go all out and pick up a full airy set and have a complete resin cockpit. Here's one last peek before everything gets closed up. Just to show how well engineered this kit is, there's actually a click that is audible when the two fuselage halves go together. Well done, Tamiya. Well done. That's going to wrap up the cockpit of the Tamiya Mustang, and now we're going to move on to the Airfix Mustang, which unfortunately doesn't have any clicks. Airfix first released their Mustang to the market only a few years ago, so this is actually quite an up-to-date Mustang. You'll see that there's more detail in the cockpit, there's more work to be done, and generally the cockpit actually doesn't look that bad. There's lots of detail in there, a bit it's a little soft, but it is there. Airfix gives you the option of having a pilot in the cockpit or having it empty, and they've given you some seatbelts to install with the kit. Unfortunately, as great as this is, the seatbelts are quite out of scale, and if you would work out the math, the belts for the lap would be about 3 inches thick. So to correct this, I decided to remove the seatbelts and try to go for a sheepskin look on the seat backing. It's up to you which route you want to go. One thing I've seen Scalehanger182 do to upgrade the look of one of his seats for a sheepskin look was to saw some resin parts just to use the dust to try to recreate that look. Just remember though, anytime you're working with resin, make sure you're wearing a respirator and you're wearing gloves as this stuff is not very healthy for you. The shavings are held in place with super glue. With the seatbelts removed and the sheepskin on, it's now time to move forward with the build. In hindsight, the weird leather background that the Airfix had on the seat didn't make sense either. I don't know why Airfix insists on having such large sprue gates, but they do, and that just means some more cleanup work when you're cutting the parts out. And what I thought here was a simple mold line was actually from the joystick being offset. So it's actually moved rearwards almost a half millimeter on the right hand side. Most likely the mold does not line up 100% here. So with all things airfix, as usual, it's time for some cleanup. Are those injector pin marks right there? What a stupid place to put those. I'm going to use some Tamiya white putty to fill those holes, and then I'm going to literally put a sanding sponge on a stick and spend the next few hours trying to clean those up. More injector pin marks on the inside of the radiator bay. Why can't these be on the outside? Holy crap, it's time for more cleaning. Rather than watching me clean up Airfix's molding and issues for the next few minutes, let's watch something more productive as I rescue some ducks at work. It turns out these baby ducks were stuck behind a jersey barrier and didn't know how to get back oh, to their mum. Okay then. I have to wash, wash my hands after this. Today on Duck Rescue. I'm trying to help you. I'm trying to help you. You're feisty and kind of dumb. Whee! With the ejector pin marks cleared up, I'm trying to get the panel to seat, but there's almost a two millimeter gap all around where it could sit, so it's a little bit of guesswork and some test fitting before you can move forward. Airfix has decided to do the radiator is several pieces, and if these don't line up correctly, you're gonna run into some issues downstream. You're gonna wanna do a lot of test fitting here and have a nice square to line this all up against. Make sure you haven't left any overhang or set yourself up for some disaster.
Now that the inlet outlet is together for the radiator, I'm going to install the throttle and the cockpit and all the other remaining pieces before paint. To prepare for paint, everything is primed with Mr. Surfacer 1500 Black. Just before the start of the Korean War, P-51s, now named F-51 Mustangs, actually had the cockpits repainted in black. A lot of photos of weathering in the cockpit from this time period show that there were some green chips that showed through the black. A lot of these F-51s, after use with the United States Air Force, were sold to Canada and became part of the Royal Canadian Air Force. I applied chipping fluid over the green paint and then used a sewing needle for the fine scratches I wanted in the cockpit. I didn't want to use a brush for the chipping because then it would be too large and a little less control. Compared to the basic Tamiya Mustang cockpit, you can see that Airfix has greatly improved on the amount of detail you can see. The Airfix Mustang is priced a little bit higher than the Tamiya Mustang and will set you back $37 Canadian. Here I'm just dry brushing some white paint over the ghost gray that was used to paint the sheepskin. If hairspray chipping isn't your thing, you're also able to add chips to a model using a sponge and some paint. You just have to be careful not to use too much paint or it takes away from the effect and it looks fake. Reference photos of a later aged Mustang show some silver chipping on the control stick. I'll also add some silver chipping to the seat just to bring out the layers of paint that are on this aircraft. I'm bringing in another layer of weathering here using some acrylic dust on top of that black. If you want to make some of your own acrylic dust wash, it's not that hard. Head on over to Uncle Night Shift and watch his video on how to do it. You're simply going to have some water, some dish soap, and a couple drops of paint, and away you go. There's nothing magical about it, and you should have all the components in your stash right now. Unlike some of their earlier models, the decals for this kit drop cleanly onto the instrument panel with zero issues for fit. With the acrylic dust dry inside the cockpit, I seal everything in with a couple coats of flat clear, and then add the glass to the gauges using Tamiya X22 gloss. One of the downfalls of this Airfix kit is that the fuselage halves have to have some sanding and work done before they can go together because they don't fit with that radiator section. You can see this isn't cut square and the plug itself isn't square so you have to just clean them both up before you can put them together. I'm not sure why Airfix did this, if this was how they planned on aligning everything, but it does cause some issues. This will have to be sanded and rescribed down the road. And speaking of parts that don't fit, the fillet for the tail does not fit either. To get the most out of this mold, Airfix has a filletless tail plug that goes in here, but unfortunately the plug doesn't seat correctly because it's cut at a 45 degree angle and the place where it sits is cut at 90. To correct this, I took my sprue cutters and just cut the locating tab off of the fillet. With a little bit more test fitting and sanding, I was able to seat the fillet properly and still have a panel line left over. That's much better than it was. If the left hand side needed some work, the right hand side needed even more as the gap for that plug to sit in wasn't cut square. So because it's rounded, it was pushing the fillet out of place. Once that was cleaned up, again, the locating tab was cut off the fillet and I was able to get that in place cleanly. See this tail wheel bay half? It doesn't sit flush either and it doesn't locate properly, so that's going to require a little bit of work to be nice and square before the tail wheel is installed. Now with those radiator tabs cleaned up, the fuselage halves should come together nicely. That radiator tab on the left hand side, that's not the kit's fit, that's my work having it fit nicely like that. I wasn't out of the woods yet though because now the two fuselage halves would not fully close. I don't know if I shot myself in the foot, but now that everything is going together so nicely around the radiator, I can't get the tail section of the plane to close fully. That insert from the radiator that's still black here is keeping the tail from closing. 
this is the type of stuff I've run into with Airfix kits that kind of sucks the fun out of modeling. Tamiya's Mustang from 1995 went together with no issues in two nights. This is night five of the Airfix Mustang, and it's still not going together. That gap will have to be addressed in the next episode. So now let's move on to the Edward Mustang, which is the most expensive of the three coming in at $68 Canadian. But because this is an Edward Profi pack kit, you also get masks for the window, you get some photo etch details, and you generally have a few more liveries to choose from. And the old saying, you get what you pay for, comes into play here because this cockpit is beautifully detailed. You get multiple items that are molded by themselves, like the batteries, the seat back, the fuel tank. So when it all goes together, you get some very crisp detail that Airfix and Timmy is not able to do with their kits. Well, to me, it wasn't able to do it in 1995. If you've seen their new Lightning and Spitfire, they're leading the pack with how to properly model a kit. But this is the Edward section, so we'll keep talking about Edward. There's a few options for controls in the cockpit, so make sure you're checking your livery and what parts go with which one, because it's very easy to mix up if you're not paying attention. Unlike the Airfix Mustang, the panels in the Edward Mustang fit snugly in place and the locating pins pretty much lock them in. There's no slop and there's no guesswork involved. The only real issue when putting the cockpit together is this small piece here. You have to make sure it's seated properly because it doesn't really positively lock in place, but it's pretty straightforward where it goes. And just to show you how well engineered the Edward Mustang cockpit is, even with the many parts involved, significantly more than the Tamiya Mustang, it went together in almost the same amount of time. You'll notice I'm using a different color green for the cockpit on the Edward Mustang, and that's because I picked up some Mission Model interior green, and I found it's a lot closer to the U.S. interior green than the AK interior green I was using. It was a little bit more of a lighter tinge, closer to me a cockpit green, but the Mission Model paints were a lot more accurate in my opinion. Instead of using raw umber for the oil paints this time around, I used burnt sienna for a little more red. If you have three Mustangs to build, you might as well try some different stuff just to see how it compares. Once again, chipping the floor for that worn look. Cockpit components are painted with Vallejo model color paint. They're very high pigment paints designed for brush use, so you get a lot better coverage than you do trying to thin down Tamiya paints to do the same thing. Because the detail is so defined in the Edward cockpit, it's very easy to pick out those components for painting. The fuel tanks in the Edward Mustang I brush painted with Vallejo German Gray just to give them a little bit different color than the radios, which should be just a straight black. Edward also calls out for the radio frame to be black, but reference photos of the Mustangs show that frame is green. I've recently picked up a pair of Optivisors and they really help with picking out the smaller details in the cockpit for painting. Unfortunately, with Optivisors, it blocks out a lot of your depth perception, so I've bumped the camera a few times. So I apologize now for the shaking you're witnessing. And to make sure I don't have too much paint loaded on my brushes, I just wipe a little bit off on my fingernail. If you've seen people painting miniatures, that's a trick I've stolen from them. With everything painted, I now bring out the last little bit of detail with some dry brushing of some silver paint. Another tip I'm going to give you now that I picked up from Smithy's Hanger, check him out if you get the chance, is to put the tail wheel in before you close the fuselage halves because it's a lot easier to access and you can see what you're doing better. He told me that it's a lot harder to do once the fuselage halves are together, so I'm going to trust him and do it this way and I suggest you do the same thing. With a flat coat in the cockpit, I'm now adding some Tamiya panel liner as a wash just to try to add some shading and some depth to that cockpit paint. That is a lot of green to look at. Once that panel liner's had a little bit of time to dry, I'm then gonna come in with some odorless enamel thinner and just blend it out a little bit. When it comes down to it, the Edward Mustang wins for detail in the cockpit for this category. Uh, I don't think we're, any of us are surprised there, but when the kit costs twice as much as the others, we're expecting to get something for that money. And Edward hasn't disappointed.
And once again, the cockpit clicks pretty much into place and there's no guesswork. But we are going to pump the brakes a little bit here because one issue that you will have with the Edward Mustang that's been talked about on my community channel is when you close the fuselage halves together, there is some slight binding at the back of the radiator. And the cause of this is one of the pins for the radiator location. So you're going to have to get in and adjust that to get the two halves to sit together cleanly. One negative I can give you about the Edward Mustang, and it will come up in the next video, is that the bottom of the aircraft, the detailing is a little soft, so I'm going to have to do a little bit of scribing there and some riveting just to bring it back to the same quality as the rest of the airframe. One other thing I should mention about the Edward cockpit is that the photo etch instrument panel has a little bit of graininess to it, and it felt like it was kind of a letdown for the cockpit, so I decided to just use the kit part and the decal instead. I'm going to save that photo etch panel for a P51B I have in the stash. I also found that brush painting the 3D details looked a lot better than a 2D photo etch print part. So what I'm saying there is you can probably pick up the weekend edition of this Mustang and still have a great build on your hands. That brings us to the end of episode one of Mustang Madness. I hope you've enjoyed it. As always, leave your comments and criticism in the comments section below. And why don't you let me know what your favorite Mustang has been that you've built? What kit was it? What did you like? What didn't you like? This is the Model Guy, and I'll talk to you later.